Welcome everyone. This is Kathy Lancaster at the Library of Michigan and I'm really excited to have uh, Jen Taggart, Laura Holster, Sarah Skinner, Marta Kate Jackson all here with us today um, from various libraries across Michigan to talk to us about adapted sensory programming for all ages and all budgets. Just a few housekeeping notes. Um, on the bottom right, we do have some files that you are welcome to download, uh, including the slides to this presentation, as well as some resource lists. So you can just download those if you click on a file name in the bottom right uh, box on your screen there. Also, um, we're going to be switching presenters throughout the this next hour. and. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. We might not get to them right away during the presentation. I'll try to make notes and uh, get back to some of those questions if we're not able to answer them in the moment. So with no further ado, I would like to thank uh, all of our presenters here for sharing uh, their experiences with us um, on this webinar, and I think we're going to get started here with Jen. All right, good afternoon, everybody. So um, this past spring, um, we conducted a survey of libraries throughout Michigan, and the purpose of that survey was to determine what is being offered in the way of adaptive programming for uh, library patrons of all ages, youth, teens, and adults. And we, what we asked in that survey was um, whether or not the programming was adapted. So what kinds of tools do you use to adapt those programs to make them inclusive of people of all ages with special needs? And that, of course, leads to whether or not the program is inclusive. In other words, all abilities are welcome, or whether the program is targeted exclusively for patrons with special needs. And then um, lastly, um, what type of program are you offering? Is it something like a sensory story time? Is it an activity um, that you do uh, weekly or monthly? And we really got a variety of responses um, and from a variety of different libraries. And that is one of the reasons why we are calling this webinar Adapted Sensory Programming for All Ages and All Budgets, because this is something that can be done by any library. So here is here are basically some of the responses that we got. And we heard from about 20 libraries across the state of Michigan, and again, from all over Michigan. Um, so many libraries are offering sensory story times. Um, and those sensory story times, uh, some of which are geared to children, some of them are for teens, and some of them are for adults, or teens and adults combined. Um, it was probably about half and half. Some uh, of these programs are inclusive of all abilities, and some of them are targeted specifically for families with special needs. Um, we are also finding that um, some libraries are offering um, special outreach to special education classrooms, so bringing those sensory story times to your local schools. And, um, and then we have adaptive programs for youth, teens, and adults with visual impairment. So we have some specific programs that are geared to um, folks of all ages with visual impairments. And then, of course, uh, we also um, received quite a few responses on weekly and monthly activity groups for adults with developmental disabilities and other special needs. And then um, some libraries are also offering um, things like sensory-friendly movies, so taking a cue from Imagine and AMC and offering sensory-friendly movies where you keep the lighting at a, at a lower level but not completely dark, and a non-judgment zone, um, so relieving some of that caregiver anxiety. Yes, it's okay to make 
um, to make those noises. And yes, it's okay to get up and move around if, if you need to. Okay, it's a no judgment zone. Or offering things like adapted yoga um, or adapted theater workshops. Um, I know we have um, at the Bloomfield Township Library and many other libraries have had Delightful Yoga um, and the Four Fall Theater Company come in and do programs. Um, they are wonderful at working specifically uh, with groups with special needs. Um, and then, of course, there are some great after hours and before hours targeted programs for families of all ages with special needs. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of those specific items here. Um, so what are we doing specifically um, in the way of sensory story time? So what, what, how are we adapting them? So we use different tools. Um, one of the probably biggest tool you can use is, is a visual schedule. And that is, um, there's a picture on the slide here of an example of a visual schedule used in sensory story time here at the Winfield Touch-Up Library. Um, and basically, that is letting folks know um, what is going to be done in story time. So for example, people with autism, ADHD, sensory processing disorder, they respond much better if they know exactly what is going to happen and there are no surprises. So they're more comfortable with that. So with this picture schedule, you can see what's coming up and what has been done. So you point to the picture when you're about to do something and then you remove the image when you're done and you can see what's going to be done next. This also works great for families that are English language learners as well. Um, so other things that are being done, um, rhythmic interactive stories, of course, but it doesn't always have to be a rhythmic story. Um, we found in our teen and adult sensory story time that you can also um, use a great um, nonfiction picture book that um, invites uh, some interaction, some conversation, um, socialization. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be rhythmic or um, rhyming in nature. Uh, therapeutic movement, um, using yoga positions um, in your story times, or um, what's called a crossing the midline exercise, where you're basically coordinating both sides of the brain with a specific movement. Um, Multi-sensory experiences, um, you, you know, utilizing um, tactile manipulatives so that perhaps somebody with um, low vision can experience a story that you are reading, but maybe they can't see the illustrations. Um, using sign language in your story time. Um, stories available in multiple reading formats. Uh, you know, you might consider offering a book in Braille or, um, you know, audio books as well. Adaptive seating. Some folks um, like to use um, things like um, EduCube chairs uh, or something um, that's called a backjack, which are both supportive chairs. Um, backjack's a little bit better if, if, you're, if you have somebody that's a little bit older because it can accommodate all sizes. Um, and things like dimmed lighting. If you have fluorescent lighting, um, you know, sometimes we can't get away from that. If you can dim it, that is um, a great way to make your program um, more um, welcoming. Um, sensory play or craft after. Um, interactive discussion about the theme. This is especially important for story times for teens and adults with special needs. Um, if you have a large group, you know, some libraries uh, will scan the book and project it on screen for a larger class or crowd, for example. Um, using flannel boards to accompany your um, story that you're reading sort of gives you that, that double visual. Um, so you have something to reinforce what you're reading. Um, and then some libraries, um, which I'll, I'm going to mention a few later on, are offering their story times at a less crowded time. So maybe they're offering it before hours opening. 
Um, and then some libraries also like to use fidgets in their story time um, for those that um, might need a little more movement in the story time and can help them to um, focus a little bit better. So what are some examples of some of the programming for patrons and visual impairments being done out there? Um, there's a lot of great examples. Um, so the Taylor Community Library, uh, for example, um, is offering an audio book discussion group uh, specifically for those with visual impairments. They offer a visually impaired support group and assistive technology talks. Um, the Braille and Talking Book Library offers a specially adapted summer reading program um, for um, youth with um, visual impairments. Uh, for ages uh, 0 to 18, and, and, the, and the summer reading program is available in adapted multiple formats. So you've got large print, electronic, and Braille. Um, in the Superior District Library, specifically their Bayless location, they're offering a great program called VIPs, which is an adult group with visual impairments. They meet once a month, and they offer a variety of different pro activity type programs. Sometimes they have speakers come in, like for example, they had the Meyer store come in to talk about their particular needs when shopping. Okay, so quite a variety of things going on. Um, activity groups for teens and adults with special needs. Um, so in addition to uh, a monthly sensory story time for teens and adults with special needs, there are also libraries that are offering um, different kinds of activities. So, um, for example, your sensory-friendly movies. Um, and I know um, Sarah and um, Laura are going to talk a little bit more about their um, group uh, the programming that they offer. Um, the Celine District Library offers a wonderful program called, and it's a monthly program called their Liberty Club Story and Talk. Um, and um, that is for adults ages 26 and over with developmental ages ranging in age from 8 to 20. And they um, offer kind of a combination of, of a story time and um, they do also come in weekly to help volunteer with things like um, cleaning the picture books throughout the school year. Um, they do art, pro art projects, for example. Lots of different things going on. Um, having game days um, and volunteer projects. And let me just um, give a little shout out to um, my uh, friend Lori Morris at the Orient Township Library. They have a spectacular volunteer program for um, teens and adults with special needs. So if you're looking to do something like that, I highly recommend looking into that. And then what about those after um, or before hours events? So um, as I mentioned, some libraries, uh, like the Novi Public Library, they are offering a um, monthly program called their Sensory Sunday Storytime. And they offer this before the library opens on Sundays. So again, um, you are alleviating some of that caregiver anxiety. Um, so, um, and again, that's targeted specifically for families with special needs. Uh, here at the Bloomfield Township Library, we do offer, um, twice a year, we've been offering a, an after-hours event. We call it our Special Needs Family Fun Friday. Uh, we hold it on a Friday evening um, after we close at 6.30. So um, we offer things. Um, um, like sen different sensory activities. Um, we have visuals throughout the library so they know what to expect in each area. We offer a calm down room. We turn our story room into a calm down room. So we dim the lights and we have a little pop up tent and some fidgets and um, weighted lap cushions um, to give a little more um, comfort and additional sensory input for those that need it. Um, and uh, again, this is a great way to be more welcoming to families with special needs that, again, um, might have some of that caregiver anxiety and they're worried about judgment. Um, so that's a great way to reach out to those families. And, you know, we, we love doing this because it's, 
sometimes we see people coming to these after hours um, events and these are folks that we don't often see at the library. In fact, oftentimes we rarely see them at the library and when they come to these um, after hours events, it's really, um, really nice to see them reaching out. And um, and then what what about some of the feedback that we um, the feedback and the learning experiences that um, were mentioned in the survey? Um, again, um, multi format marketing marketing is so very important for adaptive programming. Um, you, you really need to reach out to this community, this portion of your community. So flyers. Um, emails to um, the schools, uh, the special education department. I have found that reaching out to um, the special education PTO groups, many school districts have a PTO group specifically for their families with special needs receiving special education services. So go on to those school websites and find out who those contacts are and reach out to them. And they are very grateful and they're um, more than willing to share that information. Um, posters, library cross promotions, social media, share, share, share. And um, getting out to those uh, organizations in your community, those special needs advocacy organizations is really key. And of course, word of mouth. Um, and um, of course, being cognizant of a range of developmental ages and abilities. Um, so, you know, for example, you can have a 26-year-old adult, but they are, are going to be, you know, developmentally perhaps around five or six. So you need to be cognizant of those um, abilities. Uh, collaboration with teachers and or therapists in your community is key. If you're not sure what to do, or what to offer, reach out to your teachers and therapists to find out what would be most helpful. Uh, creating a welcoming environment. Um, and again, being welcoming in your marketing as well. Um, if you're going to be inclusive in your program, all abilities are welcome. Don't target it to a specific diagnosis, for example. Um, and please know that success for this particular type of programming is not measured by numbers. You may not see a, a, a big turnout for your sensory story time the first few times or even the first five to ten times. You may have anywhere from two to ten or maybe more than that or maybe less than that. And it's not always um, consistent. But I will tell you that the families that are coming to these programs are so incredibly appreciative. And of course, above all, what everybody has um, uh, noted in their survey is to be open to feedback from caregivers. Um, so be open to those suggestions. And now I am going to turn it over to uh, Marta Kate Jackson from the Cromain District Library to talk more specifically about um, what programming they are offering. Thank you so much, Jen. Hello, everybody. I hope everyone can hear me. So, yes, my name yes. is Marta Kate Jackson. I am the Youth Services Manager at Heartland's Cromain Library. I'm going to quickly tell you about the four different programs that we currently offer for individuals with special needs. And then I'm going to go into more detail specifically about our sensory story time and the partnership with our local early on program that's really helped us to develop and promote the program. Um, first, I should mention Cromain is located in southeastern Michigan. Uh, we're just north of Brighton, if you're familiar with the area at all. And uh, we are a class 5 library. We serve a population just over 26,000, which I actually believe might be the minimum for a class five. So when I say just barely, I really mean we're just barely. Um, so yes, we offer four different programs at the moment. Two for adults, which you can see listed here. We have a monthly story time, which is actually not promoted um, much to the public. It's actually more of a private story time that we offer to a group called Freedom Work Opportunities. Uh, Freedom Work is located, I believe it's in Milford and Highland area. 
and they offer differently abled individuals with opportunities for vocational training, job placement, uh, social events and outings, things like that. And the library is just one of their partners. So our adult story time is essentially one of their outings for the month. We also have a cleaning crew that comes in from Freedom Work, which is an opportunity for um, the, it's actually for a different set of adults. So we see different adults at the story time and a different set for the cleaning crew. And it's an opportunity for them to learn some basic cleaning skills. Uh, we, they wash some windows, they dust monitors, dust shelves, things like that. And it's certainly the cheapest program that we offer because we really don't provide much at all. The, um, the group comes in with their uh, organizer from Freedom Work. We provide basic uh, cleaning supplies for them, and they just take it from there. For our teens, we offer a very inclusive teen volunteer program. So this is absolutely open to the public. Um, any and all teens in grades 7 through 12 are welcome to participate and apply. And we're happy to include teens with special needs and truly make their experience as inclusive as possible. They attend the exact same orientations and trainings as all of um, the other neurotypical teens and uh, generally assist at the same programs as well as doing many of the same tasks, whether it be preparing crafts for a program, um, things like that. The only real difference you could say is that we are a little bit more aware of which tasks we're providing them just to make sure that they are ability appropriate tasks. And of course our sensory story time for children, that's uh, completely open to the public as well for all ages and their families. And on our next slide here. Here's our basic flyer for our sensory story time. As you can see, it's a 45-minute program. We offer it once a month, uh, usually on Fridays at 1030. And we do limit registration to 12 children and their families or caregivers. The basic description here is just join us for stories, music, movements, and play. It's designed for ages 2 to 5 and their families, but all ages welcome, and we truly mean that. Um, we say that it's for all children, but especially welcoming to those who have a hard time in large groups or are on the spectrum, which is another reason why we do try to limit registration, just to make it a more um, welcoming and enjoyable uh, environment. So to break down our story time a little bit more to give you a better idea of what we actually do in the program, we spend about 20 to 25 minutes doing essentially um, a typical story time, you could say. We just add in a bit more movement and a lot more interactivity. We usually limit it to about two stories. And with each of those, we do double visuals for the most part. So for example, in addition to holding and reading the book, we might also have a flannel that goes along with it. Maybe we'll use some puppets with the story, uh, do some movement with the story. And um, if we can find some great props and very cheap ones, I promise you, uh, then we'll add props along with it. For example, one of my favorites with I Ain't Gonna Paint No More by uh, Karen Beaumont. We tend to hand out some dried paintbrushes that we have lying around the library for either the caregiver to help point to the child's head or their elbow or their knee, whatever it is um, throughout the story, or for the child to do so themselves, or for them just to enjoy and have something to hold while we're reading the story. With our movement songs uh, that we'll do in addition to the stories, we try to make those pretty interactive too, uh, whether it's with shaker eggs. I use a lot of paper cutouts. They're kind of my favorite thing, because you can make a paper cut out of just about any shape you need to go along with just about any theme you're going to be using. Um, with that, we even used sponges before, just some cheap ones we've gotten from Meyer for the kids when we've done bath time, story time, things like that. The second half of our sensory story time is just free play. It's a great time for the kids and the caregivers to socialize. And we set out usually three, maybe four activity stations for the kids to explore at their own pace. It's typically a sensory bin, which if you Google sensory bins, you will find all kinds, or a uh, puppets or flannel pieces that we might have used with the story during the story time. We'll just set those out so that the kids can maybe try to recreate them or just play and enjoy them. We also typically put out sensory balls 
we got our first set from the Dollar Tree originally, but I think we have a fancier set now from Lakeshore Learning. And I've got to tell you, it always cracks me up. Sometimes I wonder why I even bother to come up with different activities for the free play, because I swear sometimes they just play with the sensory balls. It's one of the favorite, uh, the favorite things at our library. And we usually try to have a craft or a simple coloring station as well. And usually some things we'll have on the floor, some things on tables. But try to do, we try to do activities that can be really um, utilized in either space so that the kids are comfortable. Um, if they're able to use a chair, great. But it's usually something they can do on the floor as well if they're more comfortable doing that. And then another part of our free play time is we typically have an early on teacher present. She is uh, wonderful about simply mingling with the caregivers. A lot of the, or by a lot, I mean probably about half of our attendees are actually early on students. So she's very familiar with some of them already. But she's also there just for general um, people from the public who might have questions about early on or maybe interested in um, having their children evaluated, anything like that. I don't um, make a huge deal about the fact she's there so that parents don't feel like they have to interact with her if they don't want to. But she does an excellent job of mingling, like I said. Um, if you're looking for some more ideas uh, specifically for stories, uh, crafts, activities, things like that. I do have a number of them at theyouthdesk.org. But uh, in the files down on the right-hand side, uh, Jen has some awesome handouts with lists of different stories and um, ideas there as well. So I've mentioned early on, they were truly one of our, our best partners for this program. It's a statewide interagency system that offers intervention services for children birth to three who may have developmental delays or disabilities. And uh, in Livingston County, early on is run through the Livingston Educational Services Agency, which offers a variety of educational services. So we, we truly developed sensory story time basically from the interest of an early on teacher. I had always wanted to offer something like it, but wasn't sure where to start. And then one day, a teacher kind of called us out of the blue, hoping to bring a group of students to our, uh, was our toddler story time, which happened to be a registration program. And I believe she wanted to bring about eight kids, so it just would have been too many to add into the program. So I offered to do a private story time for the group instead. And uh, she thought that was great. But uh, throughout the conversation, she happened to mention that, well, I was really hoping to give the kids an opportunity to attend a program with neurotypical children as well. So that was my aha moment, that I, I, I didn't actually ask why she wanted to come to a program. I just assumed it was for the excellent early literacy experiences. And I didn't realize that there was a little bit more to that, um, her, her catalyst for bringing the kids to the library as well. So that was a big thing for me that I realized I need to find out these organizations' goals when I interact with them as well, just because they're not always as obvious as you might think. And uh, when I say to call local organizations for feedback or invite them along, that's been something that's been very helpful for us. For example, in addition to early on, there's a number of other organizations in the area that I've become aware of that maybe offer um, speech and language uh, therapies or occupational therapies. So we started just calling some of them, just letting them know that we offer this program, and asking them if they had any interest in stopping by and observing. Um, and many of them have said yes, which has been very nice. So it's a good way to kind of invite the people in your community to learn more about it, because the more those organizations know about it, the more that your patron base will know about it as well. So a little bit more about our collaboration specifically with Early On. Um, each family is often accompanied by their teacher. As I said earlier, only about half of the attendees are actually from this early on program. So not everyone will attend with their uh, teacher or occupational therapist, but a couple of them typically do. And in fact, many of them have actually started using the library as their third place to, to meet with those teachers and therapists. So in addition to just observing the children in the home or at um, school, they uh, are starting to do some of those meetings here as well, which is very nice. 
And by having some of those teachers and therapists in the room, it's very good opportunity for me to ask for some tips and advice on what I could do to improve and what the library could offer. For example, they've given some great advice on using uh, visual schedules, which we do, as well as slowing down with some of the lyrics uh, when we're singing. And we do a lot of a cappella as well. We uh, rarely use recorded music because it does tend to be a bit quicker and a little more difficult to understand. And they've also suggested some great songs and rhymes that they actually use for the children, too. So it's always nice to hear what other people are doing in different fields. As for um, the marketing for this program, as I mentioned, early on has been just a wonderful cheerleader for us. Um, we send print flyers along with them to distribute to their students, as well as some other local organizations. Uh, the information about the program is, of course, on our website, as well as in our online events calendar. And we also provide print and email flyers to our local school, school district, to their Department of uh, Special Education. And um, I, at first, I just started kind of cold calling them and trying to send some print flyers along um, via email, and then learned that they weren't always getting distributed, so I kind of started to stop by and chat with the office more in person to um, learn more about what they do. And also it gave me an opportunity to share more than I could in just an email or just a phone call about what we do as well. And I did notice that those print flyers started going out a little bit more frequently after that. And of course, word of mouth is truly as with any program, it's, it's a big part of it as well. And as Jen mentioned earlier, it's such a wonderful group of people to work with in the special needs community. And so once people start talking about it, they start sharing it with others in the, in the field as well. So um, you, you could quickly start seeing more people coming in to use your programs and services after, after making some good connections. It only takes a couple. And then finally, I just wanted to mention that we did change our description for this program a little bit. Um, because, as I mentioned earlier, we did want to make sure it was an inclusive program. Because for this community, we felt there was the need to have children of all abilities in the program. So it's not a targeted program. So our original description states that it's for children who have a hard time in large groups with joint detention or who are sensitive to sensory overload. And so we tweaked that a little bit by simply saying, join us for story, songs, and play for all children, but especially welcoming to those who have a hard time in large groups or on the spectrum. And that was very helpful in getting what I feel more people from the community to attend. Some of our uh, regular story time attendees started to pop in from time to time as well, which was nice. So I believe that was, that was helpful. So before I hand you off to the wonderful hands of Laura and Sarah, I just wanted to mention that if you are nervous at all about offering programming like this, really just give it a try. I know I was personally pretty nervous when I first began because I do not have a background in special education. And really the only experience I had prior to starting this program was simply with the patrons I interacted with at the library. I remember I was nervous if I would use the wrong language or the wrong terminology when speaking with the professionals and caregivers. But I recall one day I had a mom say, you know, I don't care what you call my kid, I just care if you make his day a little bit easier. So for me, that was kind of all I needed to hear to say, OK, this is worth it. And it really has been a rewarding uh, experience for everyone here at the library. And we hope for the kids as well. So I will turn you over to Laura and Sarah. Hello? Hello. All right, Laura and Sarah. Alrighty, we're still figuring out some of our technical difficulties here. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Laura Hollister. I'm the Adult Services Team Leader at Niles District Library and a proud mom of six sons. Three of them struggle with disabilities and two of them are significantly affected. And I'm Sarah Skinner. I'm also on the Adult Services Team. I graduated from Western Michigan University with a Behavioral Psychology degree. 
and I worked in a day program for adults with special needs for five years prior to coming to work at Niles District Library. Okay, um, do you already have groups of special needs folks coming into your library? Do they just sit at a table? Are they bored? And they just don't fit in anywhere? Well, you can help. Most of them would be interested in story time or tween groups. You're already developing and providing this content. So just commit to reserving it to a broader group. OK, why? Why would you do it at a library? Your community is already full of adults who have social and educational goals, and they have very few places to work on them. Um, many families like mine have both affected and neurotypical children, and we need a place to enjoy activities together. Okay, and why at a library? Because we're the perfect collaborator. We can connect resource providers with consumers in a safe and open environment. We need to serve everyone to remain the vibrant centers of our community. We know that they are, or can be. What can we do? We can offer, oh, sorry, my slide went twice. We can offer high quality, high interest events to draw non-affected families too, as other presenters have indicated. You make everything a learning opportunity on multiple levels. You can have read and return books where you're practicing responsibility without penalty. You can have movie dates where you're practicing appropriate social behavior and decision making, and maybe even money skills um, at like a concession stand. You can incorporate sensory and motor skills on craft day. Um, you can discuss the importance of maintaining physical health and wellness on Zumba days. I've, I added a couple of files with suggestions from the participants that we have here and from the CLS providers that we have here, as well as a list from the OT if you would like some specifics on uh, possibilities out there. All right, you may be wondering where you can find partners in your community. Um, all Michigan communities have a mental health gateway organization. Uh, you just have to find it and ask to meet with a caseworker or representative to determine what's already available in your community and what service holes that you can fill at your library. Also look for local community living support providers. We call them CLS providers. They're already working with these individuals or in small groups, and they're always looking for opportunities for enrichment. Um, ask them to help you um, offer these opportunities. The recipients uh, we are serving currently are adults, but their interest level is often in line with what Youth Services is already doing. Um, so we replicate, replicate, replicate. Um, we created a great program for, they did, um, created a great program for middle schoolers. So just repeat it with your special needs adults. Prepared a story time for the early elementary ages, repeat it for the adults. Love your toddler dance party, pull out that CD player and handheld music instruments. The Beatles, the monkeys, what does the fox say? Anything that gets you moving. Have extra crafts from story time. Make them into individual kits. And then when you have enough, set out the craft smorgasbord so they can choose what appeals to them. This helps with decision making and um, other skills that they need to learn. OK, and tap your community for program content. You really don't need to recreate the wheel. Stuff is already happening in your area. Just find them and offer a place for them to, uh, to do what they're already passionate about. So some examples are here, and you've got the slides that you'll be able to look at later. But some of the stuff that we've done are Zumba and adaptive dance from the YMCA. We've had impersonators come in. Okay, that picture is not actually an impersonator that came to our library. That's my oldest son, Nathan. In that picture, he's 24. And that is Merida. And that was kind of the highlight of his life up to that point. That was at Disney. But anyway, um, impersonators. There's all sorts of cosplayers out there that are happy to come in. We have a local um, princess impersonator that comes in as various princesses suggested by the participants. 
You can do, um, there's FIRST Robotics almost everywhere in the country, Michigan especially. Find one of your robotics teams. They need to do community service and they can bring in some simple kits and work one-on-one -on -one with participants. Um, the zoo will often have um, inexpensive programs for group homes and that type of thing. Ask if they do it for the library. You can get 4-H uh, clubs to come in and bring your animals. Oh, petting zoo is like one of the most popular things ever. Having a horse in the yard, boy, that brings them in. Um, the local hospital teaches My Plate 101. It's just a, an easy nutrition program that can be looped several times and people will grasp different things out of it each pass through. Um, the Healing Paws is a pet therapy organization. We've also had pet rescue organizations bring in, oh, we've got a batch of puppies, do you want them to come and play? Uh, yeah. It's not specifically for one age group or one demographic. It's something anybody can enjoy, but again, we've we're trying to be friendly and accessible to those who do have the fears, well, the caregiver fears of inappropriate behavior. We try to make it clear that, you know, you're in a room full of puppies, there's not really too many things that are inappropriate. Um, we like to show recently released movies. Okay, this is a dated flyer, but <laughs> we, they often don't have the budget to go out to a movie theater in a group. So we try to show stuff that's just come down the pike and they may not have seen it yet. And there's you know, karaoke, there's crafts, there's art clubs, there's the CLS providers themselves often have ideas on what they'd like to do if they just had the space to do it in. Okay, um, so overstimulation um, is also a problem when uh, it comes to uh, sensory sensitive um, programs. So um, here are some ideas here. Um, sitting still can be really hard for some of these folks. Um, harsh lighting um, can trigger certain behaviors. So we want to tone it down when possible. We can uh, dim the lights. We just don't want them all off. Aim for the feel you'd like in your living room rather than your office. You're going for you know a really relaxed feel. Lots of movement and activity can be hard um, when you don't have filters that work well. So a corner away from the activity or somewhere where you can retreat um, can help uh, if there is some overstimulation. Sometimes, you know, when things get loud, you have to step away or um, you can also purchase noise-canceling headphones to keep behind the desk for those who are overstimulated. Ask your local school district or local health care provider if they have an occupational therapist that would help you understand and address any sensory integration issues. And they may have some other you know, ideas for you to try out. Um, behaviors are just going to happen. It's a fact. That's just how it is. Um, their CLS workers or caregivers are there and they're trained to deal with these problem behaviors. So you should never be left alone with the group. Their workers are required to be with them at all times and to help with those kind of situations. You're merely facilitating the activity, not leading it. So helping those individuals is the CLS worker's job. There are webinars and information available online on how to deal uh, with challenging behavior as well. So as the others have done even better than I could, um, publicity is the greatest ally when you're getting your programs off the ground. Um, we've found that making colorful graphics uh, whether it's flyers, handouts, marquee signs, whatever, that cover about four to six weeks of programming, it works out best. Less is difficult to keep current in all the locations, a little longer lets them go stale or be forgotten. So once you've made them, what do you do with them? I'm going to actually slide through a few of ours while I'm talking here. Um, you can distribute them to local residential facilities. Uh, there's a lot of group homes out there, and once you've found your community mental health gateway, they'll be able to tell you how to reach them. And actually, that gateway will probably distribute them for you. Um, promote them through the ISD programs. As somebody said, work with the schools. They've already got the students there. And here in Michigan, 
you can stay in school until you're 26. So that really does reach an awful lot of people. Um, social media platforms, to some extent, uh, I've not found that to be as effective, but it's about the only way I can think of to reach the families that just aren't getting out, that may be not plugged in. We have a large homeschooling community here, and going through the ISD just doesn't reach them. So I don't know. It can be interesting there. Um, I know a lot of people, it's already been alluded to once, but the language used can be highly sensitive, especially for those that aren't used to traveling in these circles. So be sensitive to appropriate terminology, but don't let it paralyze you. Um, as a mom, you know, I, I too can tell the difference between when you're being insulting and when you're simply not aware of whatever currently popular but ever-changing socially appropriate terminology is. Um, you could be using the R word in a loving way, and I would just gently correct you. Or you could be using beautiful language, but not creating a place where my son and I are welcome. You know, it's not about the language at that point. It really is about your intention, and most parents are going to be able to tell. You know, I'll correct you if it's needed, but I'm mostly going to be happy you care enough to provide services for my sons and my family. And then once you have people regularly attending, ask them what they prefer. So our marketing uses the term special needs adults because that's how my group chose to self-identify. Again, it's about providing choice and then respecting that choice. So, wow, sorry, I had to flip a bunch of pages there. <sighs> Remember, you really can make a difference. It sounds very simple, but really, this is an underserved group. You really, really can make a difference in their lives and in their families' lives. And you don't have to do it by yourself. Find the providers and you found your partners. You're facilitating a transfer of information or of opportunities here. You don't have to do all of it by yourself. Now for us, we've been running our program for about four years now, and we've had lulls and we've had spikes. We've had times where our average attendance was about 70 at a weekly program and then we've had times where we were sitting and looking at an empty room. Uh, we recently went out and talked to those mental health gate, the community mental health gateway and the two largest DLS providers in our area to talk about what opportunities aren't out there right now that need to be filled and that's uh, again what's in the needs and suggestions file that I uploaded that was just copying and pasting an email that they gave us. And some of what in, was in there was surprising. So in the next year, one of the main things I want to try to do is create a reservable space with the tools for cooking lessons. And we're talking really basic cooking lessons like how to make toast, how to microwave a pizza. But apparently, many of those who are receiving the CLS services, their Families both want them to go out, so it's kind of a respite service, and they're not comfortable with the CLS worker being in their home. So a safe, neutral space to try to do some of this work is something they say is very, very difficult for them to find. Um, money skills is another huge one, and we did a test drive of a little concession stand. We'd pull out the on movie days, and they would know it in advance, and the prices were extremely cheap, and we made them so that each denomination of coin could be used, so, you know, your Reese's might be three cents, and, I don't know, the prices, it was not really so much the cost of the thing, this was not a money maker by any stretch, but it was an opportunity for them to be able to practice money skills and to be able to make choices and decisions just, just out of sheer pleasure. There's actually very few opportunities sometimes for that. So the concession stand is something I'd like to try to expand on. Another thing that the service provider said is difficult to find are things that happen in the evenings when they're doing um, their individual CLS, roughly like 4 to 7 p.m. Finding opportunities that are free or low cost is extremely difficult. So we're going to test drive another evening run and be more careful to not target it to this demographic, but just make it open and accessible as the others have talked about. And I think marketing is going to be the key to that one. I don't think we marketed it well the last time we did it. We also want to try to identify better tabletop or game opportunities to practice money skills with pretend currency. Um, use our, we have five Kindle tablets, maybe using those for um, personalized lessons for the CLS workers to 
help guide them in. GCLearnFree.org has got some great stuff. I mean, even as simple as how to use a vending machine, um, hygiene issues. There's things like that that they could be learning and put on to repeat. Maybe providing the tools for them to do that can help. And we also have a social work intern here at the library. This is a fairly new thing for us, but I'm hoping that she may be able to help facilitate some caregiver support and some educational opportunities for them. So that's where we're at. Um, our contact information is on there. I would love to hear other suggestions on directions we could go with this. And we're always open to questions yeah, or comments or anything. And I would else. like to note, um, Kathy put in the chat session, uh, section where it says, all ages and abilities welcome logo on our flyers. Uh, that is, um, we put that on lots of different things. Uh, throughout the library, just so um, that's kind of like our signal to you know all of our families that this is something that everybody is welcome at. It is not geared just towards children or just towards adults with disabilities. We welcome everybody, no matter what their age or what their ability is. We want you to come and have fun at our library. Great. Thank you, Laura and Sarah. So, Jen, did you want to tag on here at the end on anything? Yeah, and folks, you know, please, I... oh, go ahead. please type uh, <laughs> any questions you may have for our presenters in the comment box there while we're, while we're wrapping up here. We'll give some time for questions and answers. All right, Jen? Okay. <laughs> So while you're typing, um, I just wanted to mention a few things. Um, if, if you are looking for more ideas on ways that you can develop adaptive programming, whether it be for youth, teens, or adults um, with different special needs, um, there is a um, group of uh, librarians from across the state of Michigan um, that meets twice a year. It's called Sensor or the Special Needs Services Roundtable. Um, our next meeting will be on October 5th from noon to 3 o'clock. So if you're in the metro area, metro Detroit area, um, it will be held at the Bloomfield Township Public Library. And uh, you can just email me, and I'll be happy to um, give you more information about that. Um, and then a couple other learning opportunities coming up at MLA annual conference in October. Um, Deb Sobchak from the Canton Library is going to be delivering a poster session on her wonderful come on in story time for um, all ages, uh, people of all ages with special needs. And, uh, and then my colleague, um, Ed Nienchik in adult services and I, We'll be presenting a um, program uh, called Outgrowing the Seat, but not the Stories, Engaging Teens and Adults with Special Needs at the Library. Um, so we'll be talking more about um, our um, monthly sensory story time for teens and adults and also the outreach that we have been working on together. And I will just reiterate um, what somebody else said that, you know, some really cool things happen when youth services and adult services work together. That's very true. And um, I'd like to thank Jen and Marta Kate and Laura and Sarah all for presenting and sharing uh, their experiences with us today. We all learn from each other. and. Um, can borrow and rely on each other's um, advice, so appreciate that. It looks like Lori might be typing something in our comment box, but um, you know, if if we, oh, a thank you, thank you, Lori, for coming. Um, I, it, everybody's quiet, so they don't have any questions, but you have um, all the emails there on your screen right now, and of course, don't forget those handouts in the file box on the bottom right of your screen. Make sure you download those now. Um, so without any further questions, um, I'd just like to thank everybody for attending today, and we will see you all at future events. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.